It's a wonderful turnout tonight. I so appreciate each of you for coming. And uh, we're going to get started, get rolling here in our walk through the Bible. Um, let me just make a couple of comments about the nature of this course, and I'm calling it a course because it is what I would term an institute level course. Um, I would call it a college level course, but I'm not qualified to um, offer college credit to you. But I do teach, I'm an adjunct professor for uh, a large, one of the fastest growing Christian universities in the world. And so I know college material because I teach college material. I teach a college course called Old Testament Interpretation. And I will tell you that the content in the course that we are beginning tonight is every bit as rich and comprehensive as you would get in a college course. And that's one reason I've kind of put my credentials up here. You know I don't hang a shingle out and I don't brag, I don't write my name with a bunch of letters behind it, but I simply put that there so that you know that the material you're gonna get in this course is not something I just pulled off an internet, but it's something that I have accumulated over many years. I wrote the course, and um, I believe that it is very, very important information that God's people need in order to better understand what the Bible is all about. So I, I hope that helps you feel confident that the time you invest is going to be well invested, and I believe God's going to bless you back for it. And for that reason, I'm asking you to make a kind of a commitment tonight uh, as far as what I can plan on for your attendance. And that's the little green form right at the very top. If you'll detach that and hold it. I'm asking you to, if, if you're planning to go with me through this course, let me know because I'm going to prepare a notebook binder like this for you. You'll notice that your notes, your teaching notes tonight are uh, hole punched and so they will every week be an addition and after the 12 weeks you will have a wonderful resource with not only my notes but your handwritten notes in it and uh, I believe that it'll be a treasure that you will want to hold on to. But I don't want to make up a bunch of these and then you know, folks not really use them. So this is your way of letting me know you want this. And next Wednesday, I'll have them ready for you. And then you can keep them and bring them back and forth from home. The other thing is, for those of you who complete the course, and what I mean by that is if you attend at least eight of the 12 weeks, I'm going to prepare a certificate of completion for you that looks like this. It'll have your name on it, and the dates, and my signature, for whatever value that may be. You might want to keep it in your binder. All right. So, um, I think that's pretty much everything. I do intend, with the Lord's help, to get you out normally around 7.30 uh, each Wednesday. We might go a little beyond that tonight because I'm having to take care of a few housekeeping responsibilities that I normally don't have to do, but uh, that certainly is my goal. And let's pray and ask the Lord to be with us and lead us through this. Father, it is such a privilege for me to have this opportunity to invest in your people and to share wonderful truths about the Bible that I've gleaned over a lifetime, not only of reading it, but of studying it, of sitting in classrooms under wonderful professors and scholars of your word. And Father, I just pray that you will somehow help us to bring all of that together and distill it in these moments and let the dew of heaven rest upon our thirsty souls so that we receive something that is more than information, that brings transformation because your word is alive, it is sharp, it is powerful, 
It pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So have your way and Lord, anoint me as your messenger, but also anoint the hearts of your people and the minds of your people to be wrapped in attention and to be hungry, to be fed and to be open to what you would say to us. We pray in Jesus wonderful name. And everybody said, Amen. let me hear it. Amen. 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 And I want to also say welcome to our online audience because we have folks who are joining us tonight through our live stream. And the reason I'm not using a microphone to talk to you folks here is we did some testing and found out the sound is much better for our folks at home if we don't use a microphone for me to speak. So um, I, if I'm not loud enough for you in the back, just wave at me and I'll talk louder. I think it's good, right? Amen. Sandra, you're asking what do we need? Yeah, if you'll fill out the green form and before you leave tonight, you just leave it up on this front chair here and I'll get it and I'll go to work preparing your notebook binders based on those uh, submissions. All right. Um, we're going to just move right into our objectives. What are the course objectives? What do we want to accomplish in these next 12 weeks? That's a summertime, isn't it? June, July, August. Well, oh, and by the way, let me say this. I know that some of you are going to have to miss occasionally because vacation season, or you may be un unavoidably detained and you just can't get here, and that is understandable. And guess what? I'm going to miss a couple of these Wednesday nights too, and I'm going to give you ample notice before those Wednesday nights so you won't show up and nobody be here. We may have someone else teaching, but they won't be teaching this material. It'll be a different topic if you want to come out, but we'll decide all of that as we go along. So just a little disclaimer up front so you won't be too surprised if Pastor Terry takes a vacation for a week or two during the summer. I expect you to do the same thing, and that's quite all right. Here's our objective. Number one, we want to study the supernatural origin inspiration and preservation of the Bible, along with some of the abundant evidence for its authenticity and historical validity. Number two, we're going to look at the internal construction of the Bible, how it's put together. We're going to become familiar with the chronology of events and main characters of the Bible. And we're going to survey the books of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation learn the theme of each book, its major events and people, and how it fits in with the other books. The Bible is kind of like a jigsaw puzzle in some respects. I read the Bible for years as a teenager who loved the Lord, and yet it seemed like a bunch of loose jigsaw puzzle pieces to me. I couldn't figure out how it all fit together. I didn't know whether David was over here or Elijah was back over here. I just didn't know. I went to Bible college after graduating high school and in my first year of Bible college, I took two courses, Old Testament survey and New Testament survey, and that put the puzzle together for me. And then I saw a beautiful picture of God's wonderful plan of redemption and how the various books of the Bible and the pieces of the puzzle all fit together. And that's what I hope will happen to you as we go through this course. And it really made the Bible much more enjoyable, easier for me to understand when I uh, understood how it all fit together. Now, with that in mind, I want you to reach into your notes and on the very back, you'll find a yellow sheet like this. Please pull it out and get your pen handy because I'm gonna give you a test tonight. Now, don't get nervous. Um, this is the only test I'm gonna give you during this entire course and you won't be graded. In fact, nobody's going to see this test except you. Okay, so I'm not going to ask you to turn it in. So relax. All is well with the world. Amen. Here's what I want you to do. Take five minutes, everybody working individually on your own. We're going to see kind of what your present understanding of how it fits together is. And what you have here at the top is a vertical timeline starting with the date 2150 BC and going all the way down to 429 BC. Okay, and then below that you have um, a list of events that happened in the Old Testament. They are not in chronological order. <laughs> you could wish they were, but that's why it's a test. What I want you to do is take each of those events 
and write them in up at the date that corresponds to the event. And then once you can do that on the right side of the year, okay? So you'll find, you'll take the birth of Moses, go up and find the year when Moses was born and write that out to the right of that. Then after you've got all the events in place, I want you to take the names of the people down at the bottom and I want you to put them on the left side of the years in the date or date range that applies to them. So it may not be a specific date, but it may be a range of dates for some of those Bible characters, okay? So take five minutes and do that. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna to say to the folks at home, if you would like a set of the notes or any of the resources that we're gonna be handing out throughout this course, if you will email me at pastorterry at trinitycolumbia.com and just request the course materials I'll be glad to send those to you with an email attachment, a digital file that you can then print out or save to your computer however you want to use that, okay? So feel free to do that because I want you to be included in this and you can study right along with us. And as I'm teaching the folks here, you can be taking notes at home. So maybe before next Wednesday, if you want these notes, let me know and you'll have them, all right? Very good. Is anybody feeling a little warm? Yes. yes, warm. Mark, can I get you to check the AC and if uh, we need to uh, turn those down a little bit? It seems a little stuffy in here to me as well. And maybe, I'll tell you what, check that one over there and let's get it running too. Okay. That other one. You want those lights on? Uh, no, not the, uh, the back lights. If, well, let's see if they can work without them. Yeah. Yeah, the, the fluorescence. We're going to turn off the fluorescent lights and see if that is, is that a problem for you? Can you still see okay? Reason for that, the fluorescent lights causes a bad reflection for the folks at home in this screen. And so if we can do without it, we'd like to. Say again. Okay, I'm going to give you about two more minutes. And here's the neat thing. Uh, if you don't finish in the time we have tonight, you can take it home. Of course, you will take it home and work on it at home. And what we're going to do at the very end of the course, I'm going to give you this test again. And I think you're going to be thrilled with the difference you'll find. Corey? twice. Well, bless his heart. How did that happen? Well, just just put him up there one time. <laughs> There's only one Isaac that I know of. <laughs> That's a typo. Who was that supposed to be? I don't know. Okay. Good catch, Corey. Okay, we're going to get uh, rolling if you'll if you'll take your teaching notes and uh, follow along. If you need a pen, borrow one or hit mark up for one. Oh, Jeff, you're on the ball. He's got, a, he's got pens in the back. If you need a pen, raise your hand. Jeff has a stack of them there, right over here. Thank you so much. All right, here's our goal. We talked about our objectives, but here's the ultimate goal that I want for you and I to achieve in this course. We want to foster a higher degree of respect for the Bible as the inerrant Word of God, a better understanding of its message, and a stronger desire 
to partake of its life-transforming power. I once heard of a pastor who um, just didn't believe in any kind of formal Bible training. And at a church prayer meeting, he was overheard to pray, Oh Lord, I thank you for my ignorance. To which another church member chimed in, Bless him, Lord, he has a lot to be thankful for. <laughs> well, the fact is, God wants us to learn everything we can about his word, doesn't he? Peter said, First Peter, Second Peter chapter 1, add to your faith knowledge. And so that's what we're going to be doing. But we want to be careful that we don't come to the Bible for information. Grace brings us to the Bible for transformation. Paul said, mere knowledge puffs up. And uh, there is a man by the name of Steve McVeigh who wrote a book called Grace Walk. And he makes a wonderful statement about how we are to approach the Bible. He says a legalistic approach to the Bible carries one to its pages for information. Grace brings the believer to the Bible seeking revelation. It is possible to excel in academic knowledge of the Bible and yet not experience the life of Christ. A grace-oriented method of Bible study creates a hunger to know Jesus and to hear his voice. So that's how we're approaching the Word of God today. My desire is not just to stuff your heads with a lot of information, but to help you understand the Bible better so that as you approach it, you experience knowledge on fire. Knowledge on fire. That's what we're after. That transforms and changes us. All right, we're going to talk now about the origin, the inspiration, the preservation, and the translation of the Bible. And I want to say, first of all, that God has made himself known to us in three basic ways. Can anybody tell me what they are? Yes, you can, because they're basically in your notes. And the very first way is through the voice of nature. Psalm 19 says, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. The Bible says we can learn certain things about God just by observing the created order. And the psalmist here specifically mentions the sky. I wonder if you've seen this. That is an actual nebula in space. It's found in the, uh, the constellation Aquarius. It is called, many people colloquially refer to it as the Eye of God constellation. An incredible formation out in space that we wouldn't even know about were it not for the Hubble Space Telescope. How many other beautiful, amazing, wonderful things are out there that God alone enjoys because we don't ever even see them. But the ones that he has revealed to us declare the glory of God. Look what uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 1. He says, ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities. And these are the qualities we can see by observing the created order. First, his eternal power. You look around, you know that somebody very powerful made everything. And secondly, his divine nature. You know that he is more than human. He is God. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. So the voice of nature, and I'll just put a few pictures in here just to show you some of the beauty and grandeur of what God has created in this world to speak to us and say, I'm here. I am alive. I am powerful. I love beauty. I love order. I love everything that is lovely and wholesome and good. Amazing, incredible variety, almost infinite variety of life forms and inanimate forms as well. Just, man, think about the flight capacity of a mallard dove. Look at that. And best of all, well, not best of all, the next one's best of all. <laughs> That's my little niece who now is a teenager, by the way. She's my great niece. God made us, and we are a testament to his existence. So, first of all, God speaks to us through 
the voice of nature. Secondly, he speaks to us through the voice of Scripture. And here we quote 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the Scripture is divinely inspired a message to us from God because God loves us. He wants to communicate with us, so he wrote a book. So God speaks to us through the written word, the Bible. The Bible is the word you want to fill in in your blank there. So, the, written word is the, Bible. The, the written word, the Bible, exactly. And by the way, I want this to be interactive. I don't want it to be strictly lecture. So anytime you have a question or you want to make a comment, just flag me down. I get to go in pretty fast sometimes, so flag me down because I want to hear from you as we go along. And then, um, of course, the ultimate way in which God has spoken to humanity is the living word, which is Jesus Christ. And in John 1, we are told in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus is referred to as the word. A word is an expressed thought. Jesus is God's expression of his will, his heart, his love for us. It's, Jesus is the ultimate expression, the living word. And then in Hebrews, we have this statement, God who spoke in the time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son. So God is not limited in how he communicates to us, but what we're going to do for the purposes of this study is focus on that second means by which God speaks, and that is the written word of God, the Bible. And one of the things that I want to say about the Bible, first of all, is that it is divinely inspired. You write that in your notes, letter A. Inspired is the word you want to write in the blank. And the Bible testifies to its own divine inspiration. We don't have to go to other sources that talk about the Bible. The Bible itself claims to be the inspired word of God. And probably the classic passage for that is in 2 Timothy 3. You know John 3.16. What about 2 Timothy 3.16? All scripture. How much of it? All. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture inspired. The next verse, we quoted this a while ago, so I'm just going to take just the last little bit of it. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And the context is the scriptures. He's talking about how the scriptures came into being. And then... A word from Jesus himself in the Sermon on the Mount, talking about the Bible. He says, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So Jesus puts his endorsement on the Old Testament scriptures, which is all they had in his day. They didn't have the New Testament yet. And so the Bible is divinely inspired. Let's talk about that word inspiration. It's the Greek word. It's actually two Greek words put together. Theonoustos. Theo is God. Noustos is, it can mean wind or air or breath or spirit. And uh, we talk about, we use that word in uh, English, like pneumatic tires, for example. Pneumonia has to do with wind or air. It also means spirit. And so the idea is that God breathes his word into the hearts of human authors and they record what God impresses on them. It's breathed from God. Sometimes when you're turning the pages of God's book and meditating in it, you almost feel as if you, you, you feel his breath upon you, speaking to you through his word. Here's a definition 
uh, of inspiration. There's a little briefer definition in your notes, but I want to give you here a technical definition. It is the Holy Spirit's supernatural guidance of those who receive revelation, special revelation from God as they wrote the books of the Bible. And the end result is that the Bible conveys the truth which God wanted his people to know and to communicate to the world. This is from uh, Thomas Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary, and it's a very good definition. Um, he goes on to say that there are two terms often used in any discussion of the inspiration of Scripture. And actually, we're going to look at four terms. And those four terms are plenary, verbal, inerrant, and infallible. And we're going to talk about what each one of them means because these words basically frame what we understand is meant by divine inspiration of Scripture. The word plenary has the idea of everything in the Bible, the complete book or the library of books as it is. Every book, every paragraph, every concept in the Bible is inspired of God, is given to us by God. The word verbal uh, has to do with the very words or the wording of the text is inspired. The word inerrant means that wherever the Bible speaks on a particular subject, that it is faithful to the facts. It's true without error. And finally, the word infallible means that it's not liable to fail in accomplishing the purpose for which God sends it. So those four words help us understand the idea of biblical, of biblical inspiration. I want to write uh, the term up here that we most often use when we describe our understanding of inspiration. We call it the plenary verbal. Now there are other theories of inspiration. There is a theory known as the dictation theory of inspiration. And that's the idea that the, the, the authors of Scripture basically just were like a, a secretary listening to actual words from God and then they just wrote down what God said to them. We do not believe that's the way God inspired the authors of Scripture. Again, we adhere to the plenary verbal idea of inspiration, which means that while God didn't actually dictate every word to those authors, he did superintend a process so that what they received and what they wrote was faithful to what he wanted us to understand. Let me say it like this. God used each author of Scripture in ways unique to each author of Scripture. And there is such variety. You take, for example, the prophet Isaiah. He rubbed shoulders with kings and noblemen. He is known as the silver-pinned prophet because his writing style is some of the finest literature in the world today of any nature of literature, whether biblical or non-biblical. But on the other hand, you have a prophet by the name of Amos who was a farmer. And he didn't have the writing talents that Isaiah had. And yet, what Amos did write is still the word of God because God worked through Amos to assure that the finished product was what God wanted us to understand. And I like to say it like this. The metaphor that seems to work for me is the process of winemaking. They make wine from different grapes and depending on what kind of grape it is, what variety or where it's grown, what kind of soil it's grown in, what part of the world it's grown in, the flavor, the texture of the wine varies, right? Because of the, the difference in the grapes. And yet the finished product is still wine, isn't it? Well, God worked through these human authors and he allowed their personality to come through. For example, we get Paul's personality coming out in books like Galatians, where he gets a little bit 
sarcastic. Now we think it's sanctified sarcasm, but I mean, <laughs> Uh, he really gets in their face at one point because they're wanting to go back to circumcision and at one point he says, why don't you just go ahead and castrate yourself? Now you don't see that in the King James Version, but in the original language, that's exactly what he says to you. Whoa! What is that? Well, the fact is God used the personalities and he let the flavor of each grape come through in the process, but the end result is still wine. It's still the word of God. So that's, that's the idea that we want you to take away from this understanding. Now, the, the idea of divine inspiration applies only to the original documents. Okay? We do not say that later copies and translations are equally inspired as those original documents. Yes? So just for a point of clarity, when you say we, yeah. then who is the we and who is the so I understand. So earlier you said we believe in the plenary verbal versus yeah. dictation. So who would the weeks versus the days? I would say probably most evangelical okay. uh, believers okay. and uh, and Bible scholars okay. would go along with this general. idea. Yeah. Okay. And then, yeah. And I don't mean to imply that everybody no, in the church to, world I agrees. Know there's different methodologies and kind of different people. I just wanted to understand sure. that in general. Because there are, there's, there's a division somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah, in fact, we have people, unfortunately, in the church who don't even believe the Bible is necessarily inspired of God. And they slice it and dice it like it's just any other literature. And that's how they approach it. And we certainly disagree with them right. on that. Okay. Uh, but there are you know, different points of view about how the inspiration process actually happened. And the fact is, it doesn't really matter in the final analysis because we know that God is faithful to get his word to us. But it's interesting to contemplate, and some people have done a good job of well, then how did suggesting. They, how did they argue against the point that you made about the author's style coming through? I mean, what's the argument against this inspirational thing that you're well, to I'm not sure I understand. How do they, how, so if dictation, yeah. if, if people believe that, that how is that the case when clearly you can read and 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 get the author's point of view or their style through the reading? I, mean, I don't understand how they make the argument with that. That's a, I think just you just... I mean, people I, can I, say whatever they want to say. I guess it doesn't have to be facts to back it up. They right. I, yeah, I think you. that's a good... Point to refute their argument, actually. Right. What you said. Absolutely. Yeah. Good point. Pastor? Amen. Uh, just want to say that you just made that there's a lot of transliterations made from the original scripture, but that doesn't change the original. Absolutely. Repeat that. Amen. Uh, Rebecca's making the point there's something called translation and there's transliteration, and uh, that's where we take. Uh, a word from the ancient text, like in Greek, and instead of translating it into an English word, we create a new English word based on that. One case in point is the word baptism. There was no such word as baptism in the English language until basically the King James translation was translated, and they took the Greek word baptismo, and uh, instead of translating it immerse, which is what it meant, they translated it baptized. They created a new English word. The reason they did that is because the Church of England didn't practice immersion. And it kind of conflicted with their doctrinal scheme. And so they just chose to transliterate the scripture. Yeah, good point. Okay, the Bible, the entire Bible was written over a span of about 1600 years by about 40 authors. These numbers are not intended to be exact or precise, but in general terms. Okay, so uh, you know, Moses probably wrote somewhere in the range of 1400 BC, and the New Testament was pretty much complete by 100 AD, so 1415, 1600 years, and 40 authors. Okay, so we've been talking about the divine inspiration of Scripture. Now, I want to talk about how the, the Bible has been faithfully preserved. OK, 
Okay, not only did God lovingly and carefully superintend the process of inspiration so that what those original prophets and author and uh, apostles wrote was faithful to what he wanted us to know. Not only did he do that, but since then, he has also lovingly and faithfully watched over his word to preserve it down through the generations so that we can be confident today that what we hold in our hands as the Bible is faithful to what God originally gave the apostles and the prophets. And we're talking about the preservation of scripture. Obviously, the original writings are no longer in existence. Right? Does everybody know that? We do not have one original document. Not a parchment, a scroll, not, you know, vellum, which is leather. We, we don't have it. It's all been lost or deteriorated just through the elements and the passage of the time. So we don't have And you know what? It's probably good that we don't have those because probably what would we do with them if we really had them? We'd worship them. Exactly. We'd make a fetish out of them or an idol. And God doesn't want us to worship anything but him. How then do we know, since we don't have those original documents, that what we do have is faithful to those documents? That's a great question. And it's a question that can be easily answered. I have to admit, I get a little annoyed when people who think they know but don't know make these assertions about the Bible that somehow we can't really trust it. It's not reliable. How do you know that what you have today is the same that they had 2,000 years ago? Well, the fact is we do know. We have ample reason to know. Yes, Corey. Well, the original documents were eyewitness accounts. Yes, absolutely. But we just don't have them. But here's what we do have. Now, let me mention a couple of uh, sources of ancient documents. There was a group of Jewish scholars known as the Masoretes. And uh, they lived somewhere between about 500 AD to about 900 or beyond. But 700 AD is just a good point to fix them in history. And their whole purpose for existence was to faithfully transmit the Hebrew scriptures to future generations. And so they took the copies that they had of the scriptures and they faithfully copied them. Now, they, they observed very strict rules. Let me give you an example of some of the rules. First of all, as they're making a copy from an existing document, no word or letter is to be written from memory. Even though they've copied this same book many times, they have to look at the word, pronounce it, and then write it. And then when they finish making the copy, they have to go back and count every word in the copy and compare that count with the count of the words in the original that they were working from. And if there is any discrepancy, they wad up the copy and throw it away and start all over again. Why would they handle the Word of God so meticulously? Because they were convinced it was the Word of God. They revered the Word of God and so they would not for any reason be sloppy with the way they were transmitting God's word, they were zealous for accuracy. Now, until 1947 or 48, the Masoretic texts of the scriptures were the earliest copies that we had of the Old Testament, back to 700 AD. But that's still pretty early. But guess what? Something happened in 1948 in the Holy Land, near the Dead Sea. A Bedouin shepherd boy, this is the way the story goes, threw a rock into one of those caves and heard something that sounded like a clay jar shattering. And he climbed up to investigate and he found this cave full 
of these massive stone or clay jars, and in them were these vellum and parchment scrolls. Ultimately, a merchant got into the mix and began to sell some of these ancient documents, but very quickly the Department of Antiquities in Israel got a hold of it, traced it back, got a hold of just about everything that had gotten away, and they found other caves in the same area with the same kind of things in it and discovered there was an ancient community that lived about 200 years before Christ called the Essenes in the Qumran community there near the Dead Sea. They were a very, very hyper-religious group. They made the Pharisees look like worldly people. They were so, so fastidious to observe their Jewish faith. And one of the reasons they existed, like the Masoretes, was to copy the scriptures to faithfully transmit them. Well, guess what? The Romans invaded in 70 AD. And so the, the, uh, the Qumran community was basically wiped out, but they had hidden all of these scrolls in those caves and they remained hidden until 1948. And when the authorities began to unravel all of this and check the scrolls, what they found were lots of the Old Testament books of the Bible that were now 900 years older than our previous oldest copies. And when they compared, for example, the Dead Sea Scroll of Isaiah with the, Dead, with the Masoretic Scroll of Isaiah, they matched up almost perfectly. Very, very, very few discrepancies and nothing that affected the message of the prophets. Now that, what I've just said to you, is worth its weight in gold. Because what it says to us is we know from scientific fact that God has faithfully preserved his word for us so that we can hold the scriptures in our hands and have confidence that the God who loved us enough to give it to us has preserved it for us. And so do not take a back seat to any skeptic that wants to mouth their arrogant and boastful ideas that have no basis in fact. You just let them know you don't know what you're talking about. We do know that the Bible is faithful to the original writings. Here is a case in point. Now there are two criteria for determining the reliability of ancient texts. That's any kind of ancient text, not just biblical text, but any of the ancient texts from the Greco-Roman world. For example, Homer's The Iliad. How do we verify that it was really written by Homer and so forth. Well, there are two criteria for determining that. Number one, how old are the surviving copies that we have of those original writings? We don't have the original, but how old are the ones, how close are the copies we have to the originals? That's the idea. And the second question is, how many ancient copies do we have? Because obviously, wouldn't you agree with me that the closer our surviving copies in time are to the original, the more confident we can be in their validity. And the more copies that are ancient copies that we have, the more confident, because we have more copies to compare with each other. Okay, does that make sense? All right, let me show you what we know. We have more early reliable copies of the Bible than any other ancient literature in existence. For example, of the New Testament, we have 4,633 ancient copies. The closest second is Homer's The Iliad, and he only has 643 existing copies. And yet no credible historian today would question the validity of Homer's The Iliad. They believe that Homer wrote it. They accept it as a fact that he really wrote it. Yet they question the validity of the New Testament. Of course, we know the reason that they question the New Testament is because of the nature of the document. 
if they attest to it and say, yes, it's right, it's valid, that means they have to live according to it. They have to su submit their lives to the message of the New Testament. And so many of them don't want to do it. And so they would rather just use uh, whatever arguments they can come up with to dismiss it. Um, the best and most complete sets of the New Testament date back to 350 AD. But we have papyrus, uh, papyrus fragments that date back to the first century. We have a little fragment of the, the Gospel of Matthew about like this. It was found in Egypt, in the sands of Egypt. And it dates back to just within a decade of the time when Matthew actually penned the Scripture. Incredible. You compare this with the material for other ancient literature. For example, Caesar's Gallic War was written 50 years before Christ. There are only a few existing manuscripts and the earliest dates to A.D. 850. That's a 900 year spread. Yet the historians would never question the validity of Caesar's Gallic Wars. The same can be said for the history of Tacitus or the history of Herodotus or the Romans history of Livy. No credible historian questions those. Yet compared to other ancient literature, the New Testament is wealthy in manuscript attestation. Here's a statement by, um, well, those are the words. That's what I just finished pointing out to you. I didn't realize I had a slide for that. F.F. Bruce says, the evidence for our New Testament writings is ever so much greater than the evidence for many writings of classical authors, the authenticity of which no one dreams of questioning. If the New Testament were a collection of secular writings, their authenticity would be generally regarded as beyond all doubts. Here's a statement by Dr. George Eldon Ladd. Faith does not mean a leap in the dark, an irrational belief, a believing against evidences and against reason, it means believing in the light of historical facts, consistent with evidences and on the basis of witnesses. So God's word is divinely inspired. It has been faithfully preserved. And finally tonight, I want to say that it has been carefully translated. Why do we need translation? And why so many translations? Well, first of all, pardon? Say it again. So everybody. Yes, absolutely. God wants his word. God wants his word understandable to as many people as possible and if possible in the language that they speak, in their first language. And uh, the, the primary reason for translation is that the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew. How many of you speak and read Hebrew, especially ancient Hebrew. And the New Testament was written in Greek. And uh, by the way, the language of the common people it was a universal language of the day, just like English is a universal language. And uh, language changes over a period of time. Amen? Amen. Changes. Yeah. Um, I'll just give you a quick case in point. When I was the age of these guys on the back row, back here. Yeah, you. The word gay meant something altogether different than what it means today. And we used it from time to time. Didn't think a thing about it. Language changes. And so the need to constantly update and be sure that the scriptures are speaking in the language of the people. Let me mention that one of the early translations of the scripture, by the way, translation isn't something that just started 100 years ago, as you well know, but um, way back in 200 BC, um, the Septuagint, have you heard of that? Septuagint is translated. That comes from the Latin word 
for the number 70. That's what the word Septuagint means. And that word is used to refer to this uh, translation. It's, it was uh, because uh, a group of 70 Jewish scholars got together in Alexandria, Egypt to translate their Hebrew Bible into the Greek language. Why would they want to do that? Because so many of the Jewish people by that time had been dispersed around the world and the world was a Greek speaking world. Many of them didn't even speak Hebrew. And they also wanted it as for evangelistic purposes. They wanted to be able to proselytize Gentiles into the Jewish faith by giving them the scriptures in their language. And so it is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. It's interesting that uh, this was the, the version of the Old Testament that Paul quoted from when he wrote his epistles and he quoted the Old Testament, he quoted from the Septuagint. <clears throat> How many of you know Isaiah 7, 14? The old virgin uh, shall be with child and shall call his name Emmanuel. You know that one. In the Hebrew, the word virgin there is the Hebrew word Alma. Depending on the context, it can mean virgin or it can mean young woman, depending on the context. When the translators of the Septuagint needed to choose a Greek word to translate the Hebrew word Alma, they chose the Greek word Parthenos, which means virgin and only virgin and nothing else but virgin it was because their understanding of the scripture from Isaiah was that Isaiah meant virgin in Isaiah 7 14 so there's value in translation um, I want to also mention that throughout history particularly church history the Translation has been fought and resisted a lot of times by the church itself and by the state. And people have paid a huge price to give us the word of God in our language. A couple of examples, John Wycliffe, who gave us the first English translation in 1382. He was persecuted. After his death, his body was exhumed and burned and his ashes were scattered on the Severn River. And those floating ashes were carried to the ocean, far corners of the earth, symbolic of the coming worldwide circulation of the Bible. And then William Tyndale, who in 1525 gave us the first English translation that would be put in print he also was persecuted and ultimately executed because he believed so passionately that God's people needed the word in their language. And this is a statement that he made, and excuse the old English, but this is the way he said it. He perceived by experience how it was impossible to establish the lay people in any truth except the scripture were plainly laid before their eyes in their mother tongue. They've paid a great price to bring the scriptures to us. And then, as in translation, uh, or rather in translation, as in copying, we see the same diligent care given to accuracy. Example, when the King James translation came into being, 50 scholars worked independently of each other, and then they came together to compare their work and choose the best and most accurate phraseology for each passage. And here's what the preface to the original King James translation says. These are the translators. They are giving this book to the king and to the world. And this is what they say about their work. 
We do not deny, nay, we affirm and avow that the very poorest translation of the Bible in English is the Word of God. As the king's speech, which he uttered in Parliament, being translated into French, Dutch, Italian, is still the king's speech, though it be not interpreted by every translator with the like grace. No cause, therefore, why the word translated should be denied to be the word, notwithstanding that some imperfections and blemishes may be noted in the setting forth of it. Pretty good statement. We're wrapping up here. In the words of Sir Frederick Kenyon, who was the former director of the British Museum and an authority on uh, biblical texts, manuscripts, he says this, and let's take this to heart tonight. The Christian can take the whole Bible in his hand and say without fear or hesitation that he holds in it the true word of God handed down without essential loss from generation to generation through the centuries. But there's one other reason why I think we can have absolute confidence that our Bible is faithful to the original and to what God wants us to have. And to me, this reason means more than everything else I've been telling you tonight. Because it's God's own promise on the subject. God says he will preserve his truth to all generations. What does that mean? The Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his what? His truth endures to all. Hallelujah. All generations. That's our generations. And really, doesn't it make sense? If God would go to all the trouble to inspire these authors to write his word, wouldn't he also faithfully preserve it and watch over the translation so that what David Wellsford holds in his hand on a Thursday night, reading the scripture before he goes to bed, he can have absolute confidence that he's reading God's word to him. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise God. Very good. Get anything out of this tonight? Yes. Well, we're just getting started. We're going to be getting into the scripture, but, but I wanted to get some foundational things laid for us so that we can have confidence that what we're studying is worth studying. Amen. Let's stand together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that your truth endures to all generations. Hallelujah. And Lord, we have so much scientific evidence that validates that. But if we didn't have a shred of evidence from history and from archaeology, we have your promise that you will oversee. You will watch over your word. You have settled it forever in heaven in fact you say in your word that you've exalted your word above your own name because your word is good we can trust your name and we thank you for the bible help us to love it revere it and love the one that it brings us to the lord jesus christ it's in his name we pray and everybody says Amen. God bless you. Please leave your clipboard. Please leave the green form. If you intend to stay with us, take your notes with you tonight.